land of the setting sun, the world beyond the west. That's how the ancient Assyrians described this complex continent, this infinite variety of scene and setting, this continent we know as Europe. And we who dwell in Europe now, we're tall and short, fair and dark, blue-eyed and brown-eyed. We're Mediterraneans, Alpines, Nordics, Occidental Alpines, Atlanto-Mediterraneans. Peoples as various, as diverse and different as the lands we live in. To cross the mountains or the water here in Europe is still to go abroad. Yet to go abroad is but to discover how much of what we share has been created despite diversity and difference. The frontiers. We cannot remember a time when Europe did not know these symbols of our separation. But we cannot remember either a time when the mind of Europe did not strive to leap across them, to build in poetry and paint and stone the splendors that form our common legacy today. Down the centuries, the frontiers have stood marking the differences of geography and race. And down the centuries as well, man's soul has sought to soar above them, to win the freedom of the spirit that our separate thinking so long and rigidly denied. Freedom of the spirit, access to justice, equality of man with man before the law, in daily word and speech and deed. Through the centuries, separate thinking, separate living denied them all to countless Europeans. Yet before the spreading tides of human will, the man-made barriers to the rights of man went down. Freedom of the spirit and of speech, equality of citizen and state. These things every Western European shares today. Through the centuries, the frontiers have stood Yet gradually, the patient skills of Europe, too, have passed them by. The intuition of the husbandman. The love of excellence in factory and farm. The sense of observation, criticism, reason that launched the era of productive science. If genius such as this, born and bred in Europe's brains and hands, had not become her common heritage, all mankind would be the poorer now. This was the Europe of yesterday, the center of the world, 
a complex continent and complex people too. Partners yet rivals, friends yet strangers, allies yet antagonists. Content to enjoy each behind his separate barrier, the grandeur or the gaiety that all had helped to build. Unity and difference. That was the formula we found to cover the conflict in our minds. Unity and difference. It seemed a doctrine sensible, mature, a triumph of high civilized achievement. Unity in difference. In the shock and ruin of two fearful wars, that dream has vanished. In every tongue, the testimony is the same. In difference, there can be no unity. At last, we have awakened to stern and stubborn facts. Driven by war and famine to the brink of destitution, we have suddenly realized that life and livelihood for every one of us hangs on the work of peoples far beyond our shores. We have awakened to the harsh reality that Western Europe is no longer the undisputed center of the world. To eastward looms a giant totalitarian state, welded to a single purpose by the unity of force. Now enforcing that same purpose, that same rigid unity on our European kith and kin. Across the Atlantic stands a mighty nation, born of our own diversity. Made one from many by the voluntary will of 48 United States, and now forging beyond us in wealth and strength. For Europe, harsh was the reality and hard the task of reconstruction. Unity and difference, was that even now to be once more the cornerstone of the Europe we set out to rebuild? So it might have been if in those bleak post-war years a voice had not spoken from America, a level soldier's voice, but speaking now in terms of selfless statesmanship. It is logical that the United States should do whatever it is able to do to assist in the return of normal economic health in the world. It would be neither fitting nor efficacious for this government to undertake to draw up unilaterally a, a program designed to place Europe on its feet economically. This is the business of the Europeans. Such was the beginning of the Marshall Plan. And this one simple act of statesmanship promptly evoked another. Swiftly, Europe herself set up an organization to grasp the helping hand. And within a few short months, the Organization for European Economic Cooperation had reached agreement on the difficult, delicate question of how much American assistance each country should receive. The rest is history now. European ideas and work, American materials and machines. These together have transformed Europe in the last few years, raised her from the ruins to new life and hope. Many there are who say that it was not so much the scale of aid and effort that wrought these miracles of reconstruction as the spirit that inspired their use. A sense of differences set aside in the service of the common good.
from northern Norway to the toe of Italy, thoughtful Europeans have seen in this astonishing success a pointer to the future welfare of their continent. In countless discussions, the same questions are being asked. Is it reasonable? When everywhere around us there is evidence of the progress that our united effort can achieve, is it reasonable to revive our differences, to set up our frontiers and our barriers again? Is it logical, when so much of the world is finding unity of aim and action, is it logical for Europe to remain disunited? Is it sane, when confronted with such a show of strength, not to combine our strength in precaution? From such self-questionings, there has emerged a powerful and spontaneous movement, urging a new vision of the future, demanding a united Europe. Europe can only be united by the heartfelt wish and vehement expression of the great majority of all the peoples in all the parties, in all the freedom-loving countries, no matter where they dwell or how they vote. We cannot aim at anything less than the Union of Europe as a whole. And we look forward with confidence to the day when that union will be achieved. The Union of Europe. First a hope, and then a solemn promise. Signed and sealed in London as the purpose of governments and peoples alike. What does it mean to you and me, the unity of Europe? Just another formula to cover the same old conflict in our minds? Or can we make it something close and real and vital? Look for a moment at the things that we've left undone. We speak of the splendor of our European legacy. Are we to hand on this legacy as well? Or can the unity of Europe help to sweep these things away? Basic to all attempts to raise our living standards are our coal and steel. It stands to reason that sooner or later, we must jointly plan and jointly share the output of our European mines and furnaces. Under the Schuman plan, some European nations have already pledged themselves to do just this. A simple act of faith. But it may mean much to those who still lack a heart, a home, a steady job. And then the myriad products of our factories and farms. How can we live fully if we cannot buy them from our neighbor countries that produce them? Yet since the war, problems of exchange and currency have hobbled Europe's commerce, hindered the flow of international trade. Here again is a barrier that greater unity can help to break. European Payments Plan, another act of faith. By easing the finance of trade between our peoples, it has set goods moving once more across the frontiers. And that again means much to many Europeans, not only to makers and growers, but to everyone who shops around for something a little different, something a little new. Then the crucial question of our own defense. At what a cost have we learnt that allies cannot afford to be antagonists? At what a cost have we found out that independence in peace 
can lead to helpless impotence in the moment of assault. In the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, we have made still another act of faith, made a start towards pooling our men and materials and resources for the common security of the Western world. And as we in Europe show in growing strength our confidence to resist attack, so we may expect the nations of North America to join with us in all their might. Here, in General Eisenhower's words, is the pledge of their support. As the gigantic production machines of the civilized world have gotten into the swing of deliveries, munitions are beginning to flow, and there will be a rapid increase in the speed with which units are produced upon the uh, fields of Western Europe. At last we have realized that the only guarantee of safety that we have lies in the united forces of our united people. And now it is for the Council of Europe, backed by Europeans everywhere, to secure the benefits of unity in other fields as well. The land of the setting sun. The world beyond the west. Charming enough they were, our little separate histories. But we cannot live in history now. We cannot, we dare not live on as we did before. Let us meet the greater needs of our present and our future open-minded single-minded, one in thought and action. Let the barriers vanish, for today we need every ounce of strength that our united effort can put forth. Look at us Europeans, 200 million men and women, able, versatile, intelligent. Look at our power to produce, Without the barriers between us, it could fulfill far more of our peacetime needs. Combined with that of friends across the ocean, it could be overwhelming should war be thrust upon us. Look at the markets we could create among and for ourselves. If our trade knew no barriers, if our goods knew no restriction, living would be better for us all, brighter, cheaper, fuller. Look at what our engineers, technicians, organizers have been able to achieve, even working behind their separate frontiers. Think of the marvels they could create if they were working together. With all this in our command, what need is there for Europe to be the land of the setting sun? Look to our orchards, our pastures, and our fields. The whole wide world is running short of food. But think of the ingenuity of our more enterprising farmers, of their deep knowledge of how to coax more from the land. If this will to increase were freely imparted across the frontiers, how greatly we could add to our ability to feed ourselves. the barriers vanish. For all that we possess of energy and skill can only yield its full reward if we be united in aim, in mind, in heart, in action. Let those who follow say of us that in the hour of choice we chose the course of duty to each other. That through the unity of Europe we brought the round world closer to the unity of all mankind.